Welcome, my name is Quentin Robinson. I'm a sixth generation resident of Newton, the grandson of Carol Robinson, who was the first African-American woman to serve as an alderman in Newton, and also the sixth generation of my family to worship at Murder Baptist Church. In celebration of the 146th anniversary of Murder Baptist Church, one of the oldest historically African-American churches in New England, we will be streaming Joe Hunter's 2010 documentary, Myrtle Baptist Church, Pillar of the Community. For 146 years, Myrtle Baptist Church has been the focal point of what is fondly known as the village, the African-American community in West Newton, Massachusetts. This document tells the story of the resilient African-American community and the church as a religious center, social hub, and rallying point at the heart of it. African-American people have lived in Newton since the early 1600s, and after the Civil War, their numbers swelled as they were joined by former slaves and other migrants from the South who moved into the Boston area seeking opportunity. As more and more African-Americans arrived, they found a welcoming home in the West Newton neighborhood that was once one of the largest suburban African-American communities in the greater Boston area. Throughout the centuries, like in many other African-American communities in the country, the church became entwined in all aspects of our lives. Members are like an extended family as we laugh together in the good times, mourn during the sad, and help each other without ever expecting anything in return. The love and care we have for each other has sustained us through many challenges, including lack of opportunities, economic hardship, racial bias, and housing discrimination, which has affected many African Americans throughout history. In the early 1960s, redlining came to noon, and African American homes were taken by eminent domain to build the Massachusetts Turnpike, which was constructed to slice right through the African American community in Newton. Newton was not unique in this de facto act of discrimination. Across the country, government policies led to the demolition of previously integrated neighborhoods and the creation of officially segregated public housing in urban areas. The African American families whose homes had been taken by eminent domain struggled to buy homes in Newton but many were shut out because federal subsidies for builders in the suburbs included the condition that no homes were to be sold to African-Americans. Many families who had lived in Newton for generations were forced to find homes outside of the city. As the African-American families moved from the decimated neighborhood, there was a real concern for the survival of the church. But as Joseph said in the book of Genesis, what man intends for harm, God intends for good. Those who moved out of the village returned to Myrtle Baptist Church to worship and brought others with them from the areas they had settled in. Myrtle Baptist Church, the focal point of Newton's African-American community, not only survived, but flourished as we became stronger in numbers. God used one of our greatest times of uncertainty and fear to remind us that when you trust in him, his planning has far greater meaning and reach. We'd like to thank Joe Hunter for telling our story. And without further ado, I'd like to present Myrtle Baptist Church, pillar of the community. Sometime between 1867 and 1870, Louisa Magruder Addison and her husband Benjamin moved to West Newton, Massachusetts. She brought with her one of her most precious possessions. Carefully folded in a homemade silk purse, her Certificate of Freedom, a document issued in 1849 by Prince George's County, Maryland, proving that she was free. It was a document that the Emancipation Proclamation had made unnecessary for travel outside her home state, but she kept it close by, just in case. Louisa and Benjamin Addison were in the vanguard of a steady stream of African-American migrants from the South into the Boston area. Like the Addisons, many found their way to Newton, a rapidly developing suburb west of Boston that was easily accessible by railroad. 
In the years after the Civil War, the trickle of African-American migrants became a torrent. Newton population records show 14 black residents in 1865. By 1875, there were 130 African-American residents. And by the turn of the century, the city was home to one of the largest suburban black communities in Greater Boston. They settled in the neighborhood of West Newton that became known as the Village. It was about the year 1870, my mother told us, that her grandmother told her that she remembers walking across the Boston Common with a trunk on her head. The Emancipation Proclamation had been signed, though not entirely sealed and delivered. Reconstruction was well underway and there was a wave-like movement of many people, blacks in particular. These pioneers did not remain in the city for very long, but soon found their way to Newton where the living was easier and opportunities were plentiful. Helen Evans. It was a direct result of national patterns of movement and immigration, and it was a result of the Underground Railroad bringing some African-American residents north. It had to do with the railroad coming through West Newton in the 1830s. It had to do with the fact that there were numerous jobs. There was a huge abolitionist movement going on in Boston at the time. It was a perfect place to settle. As African Americans began to arrive, one of their first priorities was to find a place of worship. They were welcomed by Newton's Lincoln Park Baptist Church, a white congregation on Washington Street. In 1874, they separated from Lincoln Park and began holding services in church members' homes. By 1875, they had built a church on Curve Street in the village. The founders of the church were Thomas Johnson, Martha Johnson, Limus Hicks, Sarah Sims, Henrietta Rose, Jane Brewer, and Henry Jones. Descendants of these founding families have continued to play prominent roles in the life of the village. They chose the name Myrtle Baptist Church because the myrtle tree, an evergreen, is associated with steadfastness. The original church building burned down in 1897 and the church was rebuilt on the same site the following year. The decision of Newton's black community to form a separate church did not sit well with white former abolitionists like Nathaniel Allen, an educator who in 1853 had founded a private co-educational school in West Newton that welcomed students of all races and nationalities. Allen felt the Civil War had been fought to erase the separation of black and white in public life. Allow me to express my deep regret that our colored fellow citizens of this village have organized a church on the single basis of color, for as I understand it, in no other point do they differ from those with whom they have been the past few years fellow worshipers. Of course, we must expect that colored, like other people, will have their own social circles. But is it not their duty to endeavor to mingle in our schools and churches with whites? The Reverend Edmund Kelly, the African-American first pastor of Myrtle Baptist, responded, we deny that there is any prescription in the colored churches, for they are open to all classes, colored, red, white, if they choose to come. The difference being that colored are as eligible to front seats as they are to back seats in white people's churches. When they are permitted to occupy any seats at all, we organized ourselves into churches because it is not anybody's business but our own having the consent of God, ourselves, and the people organized. We go forward not with a feeling of unkindness toward our white brethren, but 
simply for the best good of all concerned. The continuing reality of racism was simply too great to overcome. Racial solidarity and black institutions were necessary milestones on the road to full equality. The Village, with Myrtle Baptist as its social and religious center, continued to grow and develop in the first half of the 20th century, becoming a welcoming home to as many as 60 families. In the early 1960s, the community would face its greatest crisis, one that threatened its very existence. The village consisted of six streets, Prospect Street, Curve Street, Hicks Street, Douglas Street, Sims Court, and Virginia Road. Sandwiched between Washington Street, a major thoroughfare, and the Boston and Albany Railroad tracks, the village was an isolated enclave consisting almost exclusively of African American families, many of them related. The heart of the village was Myrtle Baptist Church. Because of its importance to Newton and its role in the broader story of African American migration to the north, the church and the surrounding neighborhood have been placed on the National Register of historic places. When you ran down that hill to the, for the fire station and uh, you got into the village, you always felt safe and secure. So all my heroes were right here in this community. I, I appreciated Jackie Robinson and Ted Wheels and, and Joe Lewis and all that, but my heroes were, the, were right here. When you were in Newton, you went to school, everybody that you went to school with was mostly white. You, if you went to any other events outside of the village, you were dealing with people who were not black. And there was something very welcoming about being able to leave the so-called white world and go into a world that was yours, that was black. Some of the people that lived in the house, if they saw you doing something wrong, it was known before you came home from school or from playing, if you believe me. It, it didn't stay quiet. You'd get home, oh, I heard you did so-and-so, or you were in school too long, or taking your time getting home. The parents found out, believe me, it was broadcasted by the time you got home. But I have extremely fond memories of um, being a child in Newton, mm -hmm. um, in that the relationship among the children in the community was very strong. I mean, we were not tied to a computer. We were not tried to, tied to video games. Our socialization was very much a part of our development. Mm -hmm. So the interaction between the young people there, the games that we played, um, very much helped me to develop um, the ability to work with others, to learn how to share, to learn how to give and take, to learn how to lead, to learn how to follow. So many firsts in the city of Newton came out of this small community. First uh, black police officer, first school teacher, first alderman, first uh, principal of a school. I mean, on and on and on, all came from this small community. And, uh, I think that's a credit to the whole community, what it did for the uh, children and giving them a sense of, uh, of who they are and what they could accomplish. And the church was the center of that. I 
contribute that cohesiveness to a remarkable group of people and a historically remarkable group of people. And that is really what this National Register nomination has been all about, the honorary designation of this neighborhood as a historic resource in Newton. But it is the history of this congregation that makes this area so unique and so valuable and, and a, full of amazing stories. My brother and I, we, we have to go to bed, and we go to bed in the summertime, shut the lights out, open the window, and we used to call it listening to the noise of the village. And we'd listen, and you could hear, we could know my, my brother's house, a lot of people would gather on his porch on summer nights, and they'd be laughing and talking, and we'd say, oh, that's Alfred, oh, I hear Warnie, oh, I can hear Margaret. And then there was a house up the street where there often was a kind of domestic fighting and stuff. And we could hear, oh, they were at it again. You could hear them yell. And it was just, I used to just uh, sometimes just fall asleep, leaning on a windowsill, listen, and then to the, to, to the noise of the village, this wonderful place that I love so much. Right through the middle of our community was the Cheesecake Brook. It's, it's underground but there were places where it was open and we used to go down in the brook and play and you know, there were rats and stuff down there, but we just had, we had so much fun uh, stealing peaches from some of the people's trees and, and just, just, just having a great time. The West Newton Colored Giants was a baseball team that was made up of um, men from the village. And it was, as important to us as the Boston Red Sox are today. And the thrill would be, you know, they played at the West Newton Commons, which is located just off of West Newton Square. And, and it was the Twilight Games, as they called them. And it was, you know, I mean, there were so many people that would come to these games. It was, you know, like a real event. There were a couple of players who could have, if they had been able to play professional baseball then, would have been drafted because they were that good. And the church has played so many roles in the lives of its uh, members. I mean, that's the place where you might marry, where or where your family marry. That's the place where, um, where uh, you you were funeralized. That's the place where you remember such joyful times, you know, in your youth, or your Sunday school, and your um, youth fellowships, and the fun things that you did during those days. It's such a wonderful, wonderful feeling to be able to come back to some place that has had that kind of impact on you. And um, it's like coming home again. If the oldest member in the congregation would make yourself known, It doesn't take long to start to lose your history and get it distorted. And also, a lot of us who um, grew up in this community are, are, are getting up, up there in age, and you don't, you don't have that connectivity of, of the people that actually lived here during some of the times that we talk so much about. So it's important that we pass that on. <laughs>
Dr. Martin Luther King Memorial, now celebrated throughout the city of Newton, began at Myrtle in 1968. Where the people have minds work. The church's historic significance and role in the neighborhood have encouraged in the congregation an abiding reverence for the people and events of the past. Every five years, the church celebrates its history and renews the links to its origins. The connections to the past are often quite personal. Pastor Emeritus Howard Haywood is the great-great-grandson of Louisa Magruder, the woman who carried her freedom certificate to Boston. His wife Katie is the great-great-great-granddaughter of Martha Johnson, who walked across the Boston Common with the trunk on her head and was one of the founders of Myrtle Baptist Church. Symbolic of the church's reverence for its past are large photos at the back of the sanctuary that act as constant reminders of the founders and builders of the church. This picture is a picture of the Daughters of Myrtle. This organization is the oldest organization in the church. It was started back in 1921 when the pastor was having a bunch of uh, guests come in for a program and he wanted to prepare lunch for them. So he asked a number of the younger women in the church, uh, would they do that? And from that time on, they, they started, they continued to meet and they called themselves the Daughters of Myrtle. So my mother is here. This picture here is just a church gathering, but that's in the early 30s, and they just got together and, and had a, a group picture. This is um, the Brittle Baptist Church Deacon Board back in the um, early 30s. And um, I remember most of these men. Um, that, that is my grandfather right there. This is the original church structure. I think they were having like some kind of joint service because you can see there's a lot of um, uh, white folks in there. I know they didn't live in the community or in the village anyway, so there's lots of people there. On March 5th, 1962, Ground was broken for the extension of the Massachusetts Turnpike from Route 128 on the western border of Newton into downtown Boston. After much wrangling about the pike's route, the Turnpike Authority, headed by its powerful chairman, William F. Callahan, decided to align the thoroughfare with the Boston and Albany Railroad tracks, which passed through several Newton neighborhoods. The widening of this corridor the equivalent of cutting a new city block wide swath through the city would profoundly affect the village and other neighborhoods. Approximately a third of the village was taken and Hicks Street, Douglas Street, and Virginia Road disappeared from the map. Some residents were given as little as a month to move. I think there was a collective gasp mm. among the residents mm -hmm. that this is something that is going to radically change mm -hmm. our lifestyle, our lives. The news was coming in dribs and drabs. People who even were homeowners didn't really know, you know, are they going to be compensated? Are they going to be compensated fairly for their property? Indeed, where can they live? What are their options? Mm -hmm. I would say most people definitely wanted to stay in Newton. Sure. Did not want to um, venture out beyond, because Newton was home. I mean, Mom talks about being third generation. I mean, black people have been in this community since way, bef way well before the turn of the century. So that there was, I, I would say, a feeling of panic, definitely, mm. of panic. Because when they said, and then all of a sudden, you know, when they decided to come and, and uh, take the house, they just took the house and gave you what they thought you should have. They gave me about what we paid for. They gave us no, uh, we didn't have any chance to say, well, we have put uh, a lot of equity in this house and we should have more. You didn't get that chance. Well, it was devastation for me because I did not own a home. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
So I immediately had to focus on the first step. I had to move. And then I had to get out and find a place. And uh, so what happened? I went to realtors all up and down Washington Street from Newton Corner to Wellesley. All the realtors, and some would start getting flushed in the neck, get pink and red and carry on because uh, they didn't know how to deal with African American, I guess. And, um, and if they did, they tried to uh, show you something they, they, their little dog wouldn't live in. I diligently kept looking and uh, I got to the end of my road of doing it on my own when some, and I can't recall the person that just mentioned fair housing. When I called fair housing, they immediately gave me a list of homes that were listed without any apprehension of what color you were. And this was one of the homes that was listed, the one I've been in for over 45 years. Since the toll road, I've been here. When I called to make an appointment and they saw me, uh, they were lovely. Never anything, it just went, it just fell right in. Everything worked accordingly. After getting this house, um, and when I was waiting for the bank's report on our background and all, and I didn't know, I had never bought a home before, so you didn't want to be over anxious and you didn't want to act like you didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. So I just waited around and I thought, oh my goodness, this has taken a long time to let me know if it's passed. You know, I've talked to the owners, that's okay. Now what's this bank all about? Mm -hmm. And so I called, I gave him plenty of time and I called. And I was speaking to the vice president, who his words were, I'll never forget it. Could you find a house in another area? Now, mind you, I had already talked with the owners of the house I wanted. And um, I said to him, no, and I wanted to speak to the president. And when the president got on, I told him, the credit, is my credit all right? He said, fine. I said, well, that's the house. That's the house I want. Mm -hmm. So it, then it fell right into place. The self-awareness of the black community was based on our interaction with each other, mm -hmm. not on our interaction with the white community. So what we, what we felt we needed in terms of feeling secure, feeling happy, feeling productive, was based on how we were with each other in our community, in our, in, our, in our village. So that we weren't looking outside of that to be, to be affirmed by anybody else. Mm -hmm. So that when mom had that encounter with people not showing her the courtesy and respect of even showing her decent living quarters, then, of course, it became abundantly clear that there was a difference. I went and looked at this two-family, three-family house, and the lady says, oh, well, I'm not sure I want to sell it now, and so forth and so on. I knew what that was. We still lost, in a sense, because who's going to pay for the moving? Who's going to pay for this and that? You get another house, you got to do alterations and what have you. They made no uh, provisions for that. At the time, my mom, specifically my mom, took the lead in finding new housing for us. Mm -hmm. Dad, of course, um, you know, was also concerned about where the family was going to live because it meant where he was going to live. The village to him was really a stabilizing force. His whole identity yeah. was formed in that village around people who were similar to him, family, relatives, and so forth. When the reality of moving from that location to this location struck, mm. Dad, I don't think, ever adjusted to it. No, he didn't. He was in a quote-unquote white environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was not in close proximity to his buddies. Mm -hmm. um, he would often go back to that neighborhood through the rest of his life, really, to, you know, to socialize with his friends in that neighborhood. 
but he never did adjust to that. I don't think so. And the and the and the toll road precipitated that. We were used of a community where everybody knew each other. Your neighbors were. I mean, I mean, you, they were like your own family. So then now to move in a place where the people next door don't even talk to you was a big difference. They never really followed through to see, did I have a place? And they would say, well, we're going to take it this day or that day, what have you. And that, to me, was not fair. They should have seen to us having a place to be sure we were. I came home from work one day, and lo and behold, they were dismantling some things. Finally, I mean, we were one of the last two or three families that settled. And I think that was on a Friday, a Thursday or Friday. I went to work on Monday uh, and came back. Um, I, I, I wanted to get something I hadn't left. And when I came back from work, every house on our street was gone, including the house, gone. It, when the toll road was being built, discrimination in housing in Newton was rampant. I mean, it was, it was a bad scene, it was still a bad scene. I was gratified when people said, okay, we have to give these people, regardless of the condition mm -hmm. of their home, and we have to give them enough money if we want them to stay in Newton to be competitive in buying a house in Newton. When it was first uh, clear that the turnpike was going to come, and they were going to make offers, they started making offers. So the, some people moved very away, took their offer and moved, found housing and moved. And most of the people that did that moved out of Newton because what they were offered was not able to buy with the Newton. But after that, a group of people got together and said, listen, we don't think what they're offering is fair. So they started holding out. Once they started holding out, then that got more notoriety. One, it got it was never a story in the paper, but a stat to be show up in the paper. The city did not immediately act on behalf of those congregants. Um, it took a lot of bootstrap kind of efforts on the part of the neighborhood to be taken as seriously as other displaced people in other uh, neighborhoods. And it was actually through the efforts of that congregation that they got what they deserved to get, which was a, a relocation allowance fair market value for their homes that were being removed. The mayors, Mayor Baspas, Mayor Mann, and um, people from the Board of Aldermen and all those people came purposely to the church when we had those meetings and articulated what they felt about and what they were doing about it. Directed us to people like Philbin and those people to go to and write our letters. And then the American Baptist Churches of Massachusetts also supported us and they wrote letters and friends of ours wrote letters uh, to them. The effect of the Mass Pike on the Myrtle Baptist Church resulted in uh, a surprising outcome. And you would think that an action that, that was that is that violent in nature on a neighborhood would result in its parting ways and it actually made them stronger and uh, they decided that they were not only going to fight for their property rights as home and landowners, um, for their rights to have children in the public schools, to be residents of Newton. They are Americans like everybody else. They are Newtonians like everybody else. And uh, they worked very hard to make sure that they did not lose their, the heart of their neighborhood, which was the church and their congregation in the process. The cocoon safe, you know, you kind of protect it. And we felt that coming back in here. But the reality is, at one point we needed, we had to leave here. And we had to, you know, face this big world and understand that we could make it there. And that, 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 that still doesn't destroy community. Community is much more than a physical place. It, it's about caring about each other. And this gave us an opportunity to extend the community to make the community more inclusive, to, to meet new people. And so when we all moved to different places, uh, uh, we, when we had the fear that the church would not survive all the people moving away, we actually extended the Myrtle Baptist Church community. 
to all those small cities and towns and places that we all moved to. And when people came back, they brought back people that they met in those areas. And the church has grown since those times and continues to grow now. And I almost said, sometimes I think God works in mysterious ways, but I think that toll road was telling us that, that, I, you know, that I have maybe, like, I have blessed you as a community with this wonderful spirit, but you can't keep it to yourself. You need to, you need to get outside and trust that I, can, I will keep you in that same community of love and spirit, even though you might not all live next door to each other. As Myrtle Baptist Church faces the future, there is a feeling that another chapter in its illustrious history is about to be written. A young new pastor joined the church in August of 2009 with ambitious plans to extend Myrtle's outreach even further into the surrounding society. And so, what began as an act of turning inward to the protections of the village becomes, at the beginning of a new millennium, a turning outward to the wider world, where the church's lessons of community and caring are more important than ever. Well, the future of Myrtle will stand on the foundation that has already been laid. We will stand on the layers 135 years of layers. We will stand on those and continue to build. I see us in the future having uh, houses that 24 seven, they, uh, they meet the needs of persons who are in poverty. I see us helping single mothers who are struggling to raise their children. I see us addressing uh, the issues of our suburban life here in Newton, but I see us also addressing urban conflicts in Roxbury, Dorchester, Madison. I see us lifting up our hands to worship, but I see us also extending our hands to serve that person who has been objectified and demonized because they are of a different faith tradition. I see us helping people regardless of their ethnicity, sexual orientation. I see us helping people regardless of their socioeconomic background. The essence and the love and the connectivity of the village is still very strong in this church. And if there's one thing I wish that we could do, that is to take that understanding of the village and make and turn it into a global understanding of the village. The village of Myrtle Baptist Church, it is our prayer that we can take that village to the world and make a village of humanity. Mm -hmm.